Somebody else who we've had on the show a few times. We like him, and uh, he is a good broadcaster. He's a pretty good player as well back in the day. Nota Begay. Nota, what's happening, buddy? Tiki and Tierney, how you been? Oh, just out here trying to survive a, a rainy and blustery day out at Real Troon, but turned out to be a, a good scoring day for a handful of players, and we got a pretty exciting leaderboard on our hands. Yes, we do. It is shaping up to be an awesome weekend. We'll get to Phil in a second. Just a broad overview here, because we're watching on TV. We got up early. We had it on. Um, I, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot of low numbers. If you, as you referenced, Hendrick was right there. A lot of, you know, 67s and 68s. It, it's supposed to be hard to play golf when it's wet and windy and slippery. Why the good scores? I would think it would be the exact opposite today. What's up? Well, the wind switch. So traditionally, the the wind blows uh, as you, if you're standing off on the first tee. It comes from the right, helping downwind. So the first six holes play downwind, which are traditionally your scoring holes. We saw a lot of under par scores yesterday. And then as you turn around and get to the 10th tee, the course just completely changes it's characteristic and, and, and becomes extremely difficult. And so a lot of players were coming um, home in over par scores on, on the back nine. Well, the wind switched today, but it didn't pick up too much speed until maybe later in the day. So the players were able to fight it off on those first six holes, which are pretty pretty easy holes, a couple reachable par fives, a couple short par fours. So they got through the easier holes in, in into the breeze, with two, three under par, and then as they made the turn, they were playing downwind. So even though they're playing the more difficult holes coming in, they were playing with an, with a helping wind, and guys like Henrik Stenson, who I followed all day, mm-hmm. played the three toughest holes, 10, 11, 12, in one under par, and just made up a bunch of ground on the rest of the field. Yeah, yeah particularly Phil Mickelson. And, and I, don't, I don't know if you've seen a lot of – what he's done uh, today and or yesterday. But over the last couple of years, it feels like he's up and down. Sometimes he has a decent round and he's missing the cut. What's he doing differently at this Open Championships that allowing him to excel so well so far? Well, the last time Phil Mickelson won a professional golf tournament was the, the Open in 2013 at Muirfield. So this would literally be three years since his last professional victory which is uncommon for him he was one he was similar to a Dustin Johnson kind of in the middle part of his career Dustin had the most consecutive years on the PGA Tour with a victory I think he had his ninth consecutive year this year with a victory so Phil was kind of in that same little inconsistent but in that same category to where he was winning every year but might miss a few cuts Mm -hmm. but I think what was really hurting Phil the last couple years is he wasn't completely comfortable with his golf swing he made a switch to a, a new instructor named Andrew Getson, who changed up a few things, and we're starting to see a few a few more putts fall. I mean, for him now, it's really become about his putting, and I think that Troon it gives him an opportunity to utilize his creativity. He's able to shape shots, hit him high, hit him low, but he didn't hit one driver today, so he's not having to rely on a club that in other major championships has kind of taken him out of the mix because he couldn't get his driver in the fairway. He's able to play position golf, utilizes irons, and then he's making some putts. Okay, so to Nota Begay with us here on Tiki and Tierney from the Golf Channel. Uh, he is at Royal Troon. One more on Phil, and then maybe a few other names uh, that are you know within shouting distance here with the, of the lead. Obviously, he's got five majors, and there's a lot of golf to go. But just assume for a second, Nota, say if he gets number six, all right, and he gets to the Faldo territory, and at that point, I was looking at you know some of the the names above in the seven, eight, nine stratosphere. He would be one away from Sam if he gets number six. One away from Sam Snead, Bobby Jones, and Arnie Palmer. Now, I mean, if he didn't, didn't crash and burn at Wingfoot, he'd have a U.S. Open. We, we 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 know what's happened with that. But historically, what would a win this weekend do for the way he's perceived on the all-time list of golfers? Well, I like his chances. He he talked about, in, a, in his post-round interview today, he talked about the fact that he had already won the Open. The Open was perceived as the one major that he was going to have the most difficulty winning. He's had six runner-up finishes in the U.S. Open, so he's obviously proven that he can he can put himself in contention there, but nobody really thought that 
he could win this this major, and he went out and did it in 2013. So he just talked about how that's going to free him up into the weekend, and if he were to finish this thing off and come out on top Sunday afternoon and, and hoist up a, another claret jug, you're right. It puts him in some rarefied air in in the company of what we would classify as kind of icons of our sport, and he could really at any point just – walk off into the sunset knowing that he's done some things that only a handful of other players in our sport have ever done. Yeah, Noda, as you look at the rest of the leaderboard, there's names up there that we know, Keegan Bradley, Zach Johnson, who won the Open Championship last year, but another American uh, who we who caught our eyes, Tony Fano. We don't know much about him. Uh, he's obviously just, uh, just on tour now after getting his card. But what can you tell us about him? I claim him as a brother, even though I think he is uh, Tongan and American Samoan. Uh, but what can you tell us about him? Is he sitting four under par right now? Well, I've, I've known Tony for quite a while, and it's a pretty remarkable story. He's got a, a younger another brother named Gipper who is also a professional golfer and hasn't quite broken through like his brother, but – Tony, Tony's a, a great athlete. If, if you ever see him on play on television, he's very tall and lanky and lean. Can dunk a basketball with just one step. Uh, played some um, high school basketball. Was was quite a, a a good athlete in high school. And is just taking sort of that athleticism and transferring it into his golf game. And I just think you're seeing the the fruition or the the progression of a great athlete that happens to be a golfer. And he hits it very far. He hits it very high. And he's learning how to play the professional game. I talked to him earlier this year, and he hadn't won a PJ tournament yet. He had a great finish at last year's PJ championship at Whistling Straits. And he just talked about the fact that he wants to learn and challenge himself to become better every week. And he wants to win. That was the next thing he had on his list. And he went down to Puerto Rico. He won that event in the playoff in early this spring. And didn't play all that great in the first two majors of the year, but came out here, got off to a good start yesterday, and in some difficult conditions in a course that's really not favoring long hitters right now. Um, he's kind of holding his own, which and, and look to seek some good things from him. And I, and I don't think he would mind that you claimed him. <laughs> you know, I mean, listen, Tiki might be the first person to claim him, regardless of race. Nobody knows him. So, hey, I don't know him, if you know? He'll claim, I don't know if he'll claim you, but... <laughs> okay. Hey, I got a little brother in me there, Mr. Begay. Begay. Tiki knows, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not vanilla, baby. You Brooklyn, know? Brooklyn's finest Brooklyn's over in the here. house here. 